After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Now, as I've stated over and over again, the Lord's Prayer was never intended to be a statutory prayer to be memorized and recited word for word. Instead, it was meant to be an outline for us to follow as we pray. You see, the Lord's Prayer is thematic which simply means that it consists of different subjects that we're supposed to pray for. In fact, the Lord's Prayer has seven different subjects, and these subjects cover every aspect of life. So let's take a look at the seven subjects that Jesus listed in this outline for us to follow. First of all, we're to pray that God's name be hallowed. Secondly, we're to pray that God's kingdom would come. Thirdly, we're to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fourthly, we're to pray for our daily bread. Fifthly, we're to pray for forgiveness as we forgive others. Sixthly, we're to pray that God would lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. And last but not least, we pray that God's kingdom, power, and glory would be revealed to everyone. Now, so far we have covered verses 9 through 12. We're going to read this, but we're going to focus on verse number 12. Here's what it says. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Now, as you can see, I've substituted the word trespasses for the word debts. And the reason I did that is because the Greek word for debts, ophilema, was commonly used as a metaphor for sin and trespasses. You see, in the ancient world, if you had a debt you couldn't repay, you would have to sell yourself into slavery in order to pay off your debt. Well, sin is like debt that has to be paid. In other words, you've done something wrong, so you have to pay for what you've done. Well, of course, we could never pay for all the sin sinful things that we've done because the cost is way too high. Therefore, we are sold as a slave to sin. In fact, notice what Romans chapter 7, verse number 14 says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. In other words, I'm not able to keep the law because I am a carnal, worldly person. So I am sold as a slave to sin. That's what the scripture says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. So I'm sold as a slave to sin. So the debt that Jesus is talking about in the Lord's Prayer is sin, or what we would call trespasses. Talking about sin, or what we would call trespasses. Now, I want you to look back at verse number 12, and I want you to notice that the emphasis is on forgiving others. It says, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. You see, we all want to be forgiven. But in order for that to happen, we have to be willing to forgive others. And sometimes I think we forget that. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you, you must forgive others. Do you see what this says? It says you must forgive others. No ifs, ands, or buts. Not should forgive others. You must forgive others. People, it's a command. And we're not talking about forgiving someone once or twice. We're talking about forgiving someone over and over again. Remember what Just Jesus forgive them once. You don't just forgive them twice. You forgive them 70 times 7. Notice what it says in Matthew 18 verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Now, if you're a math person, you know that 70 times seven is 490. So let me ask you a question. Is that the quota that must be met before we can stop forgiving someone? Is that what Jesus was saying? No. Jesus was making a point by using numerology. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the details. I'm just going to give you the facts. But seven is the number of perfection or the number of completion. And the number 10 stands for man's responsibility. So you have 10 
times 7, which is 70, times 7, which is 490. It's the number of times you should forgive. But he wasn't telling you that 490 is the, is the minimum or the maximum. He wasn't telling you to keep a record. And when you finally reach 490 times, you can divorce your wife. Seven times 7. Or in other words, man is responsible, the number 10, for perfect times 7 and complete times 7. Forgiveness. That's what he meant by 10 times 7. That's it. Times seven. I'm cutting you off. I won't forgive. Now, forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. I've taught about that, taught on that many times. I'm not telling you to go into a toxic relationship, stay in that toxic relationship. Sometimes you have to draw boundaries and say, that's enough. But it doesn't mean that you stop forgiving. And we need to understand that. Now, here's what's scary. Jesus said, if we don't forgive others then God won't forgive us. Yeah. Forgive those who sin against you. Your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgive us. People, that's Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. And Luke chapter 6, verse 37. All state that if we don't forgive others, then God won't forgive us. And there's a lot of other verses that state the very same thing. So make no mistake about it. If you don't forgive others, then God won't forgive you. So as a Christian, here's what God wants you to do. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. This is why so many Christians do not walk a victorious life. This is why so many Christians are not happy. This is why so many Christians don't have joy. It's because they don't do what this verse says to do. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, if I stopped right here, what I would do is I would interpret this to mean I need to get rid of all of you. But that's not what it's talking about. Let's keep reading. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Listen to me. You need to get rid of all that bitterness, rage, and anger that's inside of you. Because it's killing you. It's keeping you from having joy. It's keeping you from having peace. It's keeping you from experiencing the victory that God wants you to experience. And you need to quit saying horrible things about that person who wronged you or did something uh, against you or maybe did something harmful to you. And you need to forgive them. People, that's what God wants you to do. In fact, here's what I want to do. I want to look at this verse again. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 again. And if you have any unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone at all, I want you to think about that and what it's doing to you as we read this passage of Scripture one more time. Here it is. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, people, all of these things are the result of unforgiveness, and that's why Paul has listed them here. He's telling you all of these things that are killing you, that are hurting you, that are keeping you from having peace and joy, all of these things are inside of you because you refuse to forgive. So he continues on. Instead, get rid of this, and instead, be kind to each other. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So the bottom line is this. We have to forgive. No ifs, ands, or buts. We have to forgive. The secret to forgiveness is realizing that no sin will go unpunished. Yeah, that's the secret. Now, you're probably scratching your head and you're thinking, what? What do you mean that's the secret? Well, let me explain it to you before you just totally dismiss it. Say that's not going to work. I know that's pie in the sky, Pastor. You think that's going to work, but it's not. Well, let me explain why this is the secret to forgiveness. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 4. We have to understand something about God because the more we understand about God, the more we'll understand about ourselves because we're made in the image of God. So let's understand God. Notice what it says, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Notice that the word Lord is in all caps. What does that tell you? 
that it's translated from the Hebrew word Yahweh, the redeeming covenant-keeping name of God. So this is written to those who are in covenant with God. Notice what it says. I will proclaim the name of the Lord, how glorious is our God. He is the rock, the real rock, the real rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and it's fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright just and fair. is he? Just means that he will properly punish sin. Not some sin, not most sin, all sin. Fair means that no one gets special treatment. God's going to carry out justice when it comes to everyone. He doesn't say, well, Alan's my favorite. He went into the ministry, so, you know, I'm not going to punish him as strictly as someone else. No, 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 God doesn't say that. Because God is not only just, but God is fair. Is everyone with me? Now, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, we are made in the image of God. And because we're made in the image of God, a desire for justice. That's also why we have a hard time forgiving. You see, because of the way that we're wired inside of us, because of our DNA, we want those who've wronged us to pay, to be punished for what they've done to us. In other words, we want justice. We want the person who's wronged us to pay for what they've done. Now, believe it or not, we get that from God. The only problem is, because of the fall, we have an atomic nature. So our ability to be just and fair like God has been marred. Most of us think we're objective, but we're not. Most of us think that we're impartial, but we're not. Most of us think we're fair, but we're not. Why? Because we have an atomic Therefore, nature. Therefore, we are not qualified to punish people for the wrongs that they've committed. Only God is. That's why vengeance belongs to the Lord and not to us. In fact, turn in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse number 19. This is a very important verse. Every Christian should have this verse highlighted because this deals with forgiveness. This explains why we shouldn't be the ones that punish others. Notice what it says. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, repay, saith the Lord. Now, if you translate these words, vengeance and repay, literally, this is what it says. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God, for the scriptures say, Justice is mine, I will punish them for what they've done, says the Lord. God says, you don't take it upon yourselves. Now, that's not to say that the government doesn't have a right to do that. They do. In fact, God has given. Well, the word forgive comes from the old English word forgiven. That's with an F, forgiven. It's not been uh, misspelled up there. That's what the old English word is. And forgiven is a compound word. That simply means that it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The prefix for, which means up and away. Or, or away, and giffen, which means to give. Now, when you combine these two words, it literally means to give up or to give away. Christ. Now, or it will be punished apart from Christ. Now, people, that is so important. I need to say that again, because if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. You need to understand that all sin will be punished, and it will be punished in one of two ways. Either it will be punished in Christ, or it will be punished apart from Christ. Now, let me explain what that means. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, everything that you had ever done wrong was placed in Christ. In fact, Paul gives us a picture of this as you read through his epistles. In the book of Corinthians, he tells us that when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, when we make him Lord of our life, the Holy Spirit immerses our spirit into the body of Christ. And we are joined and we become one spirit. In fact, marriage was patterned after the covenant between Christ and the church. Now, if you're married, you understand something. Your marriage was not consummated until you had sexual intercourse, until the man entered the woman, breaking of her hymen. There's a shedding of blood, and the two become one flesh. That marriage covenant was patterned after the covenant between Christ and the church. When we accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit, 
takes our spirit, immerses it into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says we are joined to the Lord and we become one spirit. In other words, our sin was placed in him. And he literally became our sin. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 21. Notice what Paul wrote about this. He said, God made him. Who's him? Jesus. God made Jesus who had no sin, be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that? Jesus became our sin, and he died on the cross to pay for our sin, and his soul descended into hell for one reason and one reason only, so he could be punished for what we did, so he could pay the penalty for our sin. And when all of our sin was paid for, God looked into hell. He saw a soul that had never sinned, even in being made our sin. And according to Leviticus 18.5, he legally raised him from the dead. But people, the reason Jesus died and the reason his soul went to hell was to pay for our sin, to pay our debt. Why? Because people, God is just and fair. And because God is just, that means that no sin will go unpunished. All sin has to be punished because God is just. So in Christ, all of my sin was punished. And if you're in Christ, if you've accepted Jesus, all of your sin, past, present, and even future, is punished. With me. Notice what it says. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. This is the great white throne judgment. This is at the end of the millennium. Everyone who rejected Jesus Christ is going to be resurrected. They're going to stand before God at this thing called, known as the great white throne judgment. And notice what it says. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, plural, including the book of life, singular. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, plural. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Now, if you understand anything about eschatology, you understand that before the millennium, we're raptured. And even those who are martyred in the tribulation, they're still part of being the, the first resurrection. And so we're judged, but we're judged differently. Because our sin has been punished in Christ, the only thing we're being judged on is what good we did while we were on this earth. That determines the rewards we receive when we're here during the millennium and when the future heaven comes down on this new earth. But if you didn't accept Jesus Christ, if you rejected him, you still remain in the grave for a thousand years. And then you're resurrected to stand before God. And everything that you've ever done has been recorded. It's been written down for one purpose and one purpose only. And that purpose is so just as will be served. Listen to me. God is just and fair. Because he's just, all sin must be punished. Because he's fair, no one receives any special treatment. Everyone's sin must be punished. And it's either punished in Christ, thank you, Jesus, or it's punished apart from Christ, which means you have to pay for it yourself. And everything you've ever done has been recorded in these books. So when you stand before God, every thought, every egotistical motivation, every evil inclination, every deed, every word will be forgiven. Because the greater your faith, the more you realize that no sin will go unpunished. And oh Lord, I hope that the person who wronged me puts their faith in Christ Jesus so they don't have to go to hell to pay for their own sin. Lord, I hope that they receive Jesus. And if they do or have, I know that that sin's been paid by Jesus. But if not, I also realize that they're going to have to go to hell and pay for that sin. And trust me, I don't want anyone to have to go to hell. It doesn't matter what they've done to me or what they've done to you or what they've done to anyone else. I don't want them to go to hell. Neither does God. So when I, as I forgive others, I come to God and I say, you know, God, I'm such a sinful person. 
Every inclination I have is evil. Every thought I have seems to be wrong. Dirty words seem to hang in my mind. And I say things to people I shouldn't say, and I do things I shouldn't do. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me. And Lord, I've been hanging on to anger because so-and-so did this to me. And Lord, I want to judge them for something that I'm guilty of doing. And Lord, I want them to pay for something that I've done before, and I don't want to have to pay for it. God, I want to forgive them. I, I don't want to be the one that punishes them because, God, I, I'm, not partial. I'm not impartial. I'm partial. I'm biased. So, God, what I do is I, I just give that to you. Lord, I don't want them to have to go to hell. Father, I know that all sin will be punished, but I want them to be in you. God, I pray for their salvation. I pray, Lord, that you'd move upon them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring people across their path. I pray, Father, that they would be blessed in everything that they do. And, Father, I thank you that their sin has been forgiven just like my sin's been forgiven. And, Father, I thank you for that. Your grace will always overwhelm me, Jesus, so that your sin will be punished in him. Because if you don't accept Jesus, then what you're telling God is, I don't want Jesus to pay for my sins. I'll pay for my own debts. I'll pay for my own sin. And you will. And for all eternity, you'll be separated from God. Now, when you understand the ramifications, it makes praying for people so much easier. It makes you realize what a horrible person you are, what a loving God he is, and how much you need Jesus. Now, if you're here this morning and you've been hurt, you've been betrayed, you think you can't forgive, let me just say this. When you start looking at what you've done and how much grace God's extended to you, and you realize it's not really up to you 